This is Remy. Mr. Barbier, this is Joe Springer from Tendies Club. How are you? I'm well, and yourself, sir? I am very well. Thank you so much uh, for taking some time uh, to speak to us. We're live streaming on YouTube. We've got hundreds of people uh, watching, and we're gonna, we'll put it up. I'm sure thousands will be watching. I, I know how busy you are. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I've got 10 questions for you. Do you have some time for us? Absolutely. Hey, y'all. Right. And uh, no, thank you for, um, you know, for taking time to ask these questions. The, the public aspects of, of cassava science is, is it, it's really an important part of what we're doing because it, it educates uh, people, but it also allows people to come to their own uh, sensible and reasonable judgment about the value of what we're doing. So to me, this is a, a very important part of my job. So Great. anyway, uh, let's start. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great. So everybody here, or you, you have your uh, sort of the fan club here. But for those new to the story, can you tell us a little bit about Cassava Sciences? Sure. Uh, so Cassava Sciences uh, was actually started. I started the company in my living room back in 1998, uh, right after I had finished um, my, uh, my tenure at Exalexis. And at the time, uh, OxyContin, the infamous OxyContin, uh, had been approved by FDA and was being launched and sales were going through the roof. What I noticed very early on were some very uh, difficult, very technical problems with OxyContin. And uh, basically, I was one of the first ones to ring the bell on OxyContin and say, you know, look, you, you can't just go by sales. You really need to look at the nature of the drug itself. Uh, I think there are some severe problems that's going to cause a big social problem if we don't kind of uh, yeah. take a closer look at it. In any event, yeah. uh, long story short, in addition to ringing the bell on OxyContin, and we, and we had a congressional hearing in the whole nine yards, and of course, no one was listening because it was the Purdue family and, yep. the, you know, and the Sackler family and how could a billionaire the family dollars, could be wrong, course, right? right? And huge dollars. Um, and uh, in any event, we also came up with a, a better solution, um, a drug that offers pain relief, much like OxyContin, but that uh, pretty much eliminated eliminated uh, many of the drawbacks, many of the technical problems of OxyContin. And uh, initially, the FDA was very, very encouraging. And each time we got closer to the finish line, it was almost like they, you know, they moved the goalpost on us. And it happened a couple of times. And you know, we were scratching our heads, going, "What's going on here?" I mean, people are at that point, people were dying on OxyContin. Yeah. It had not become a, a headline issue yet for the national media, yeah. um, but people were dying. That was clear. Uh, in any event, they kept moving the goalpost on us, and they, they kept moving it. And after, what, three or four tries, we said, you know what? We, we get it. Uh, perhaps shame on us for, for realizing it took uh, several uh, tries, but the FDA just didn't, or I, sh I should say the analgesic division of the FDA just did not have the stomach to approve another opioid um, despite the safety features of right. our drug. Um, horrible travesty um, of the regulatory policy, in my opinion, but that's, that's a separate story for another day. Um, at the same time, we had reinvested a little bit of the uh, the money that we got from doing some uh, some rather good deals with Big Pharma, Pfizer in particular. Uh, we had reinvested in basic uh, research, just trying asking the question: How do opioids work? Believe it or not, opioids uh, are probably one of the oldest drug in the pharmacopoeia. But we still, to this day, we still do not know how opioids work. So we were just paying scientists to ask the, uh, the basic uh, the questions. Mm -hmm. And they did. And uh, one of the observations is that, uh, and, and I'm going to fast forward and, and skip a, a whole lot of technical details, but basically one of the observations we, we, uh, the scientists came to is that the opioid receptor is in fact implicated with filament A. 
And uh, in particular, we noticed that uh, filament A had a, a funny shape in certain patients on this, for certain diseases. Uh, we narrowed it down to Alzheimer's disease, and our initial reaction was, this is cool. We can, uh, we can use this altered form of filament A as a blood-based diagnostic to actually detect and perhaps to stage uh, the presence of Alzheimer's disease. That was originally the goal. Wow. Um, when we moved away entirely from analgesia, we in 2000 and, I'm sorry, 2019, we also changed the name just to clean slate. Mm -hmm. uh, we changed the name to Cassava Sciences. Yes, I do live on Cassava Drive in case anyone's wondering <laughs> in Austin. Um, uh, but we changed the name and focused 100% on Alzheimer's disease, uh, both with the blood-based um, uh, investigational diagnostic, but more importantly, we also came up with the concept that said, if this altered protein, if altered filament A is found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, is there a drug we can develop to actually restore the proper shape and function of filament A? And uh, again, I am I am skipping massive amounts of yeah. important details, but for for this purpose, I think we can. Sure. Uh, long story short, is that yes, we did come up with a small molecule, a proprietary small molecule, and in fact, a family of molecules that uh, that are intended to restore the proper shape and function of filament A. And we ran our drug in all sorts of um, animal studies for animal models of Alzheimer's disease, um, cell culture, postmortem tissue, you know, you name it, we did it. And each time we, we ran an experiment, we found very intriguing uh, effects. Um, we published, uh, honestly, we had a tough time publishing some of the early studies uh, just because people were saying, actually, people were saying much of uh, a lot of the things they were saying now, which is, you know, no one's ever done this before. Uh, how can this be? And our reaction was, well, you should publish it because no one's ever done it before. That's, you know, if you only publish stuff that's been, yeah, that's it's the very nature of innovation. Um, so we uh, we did it the long, slow way. We we really did a lot of animal models, a lot of tissue models before filing the IND. I call it slow drug development. We took a, gosh, I want to say over 10 years to go from small molecule to actual uh, patients. Wow. And once we went into, uh, well, you know, we filed the IND with the FDA. It was accepted within 30 days. We then went into human volunteers and saw very clean safety, which is a very, very important concept to us. Uh, we then did a, a small uh, phase 2A is what we called it. It was a small study, 13 patients open label. And because the numbers are so small, we said, you know what, let's only look at biomark or let's predominantly look, I shouldn't say only, let's predominantly look at biomarkers why biomarkers? Because biomarkers don't lie. Right. There's no placebo effect with biomarkers. You know, either they move up or down or they stay stable. And that's what we did. We looked at uh, biomarkers in the brain, uh, CSF, cerebral spinal biomarkers, and we saw very intriguing effects. And we were very excited about these effects. We um, we sent the the effects to our advisors and you know NIH and everyone we can anyone and any anyone who's in a position to help us, and I think there was a universal reaction of of this is pretty cool, but it's an open label study, right. uh, so you really need to repeat it. And if it replicates in a, a randomized placebo controlled trial, then we can get much more excited about things. Fair enough. So uh, we applied for and received an NIH grant to do a phase two, what we call a phase 2B, consisting of 64 patients. These are all patients with uh, mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And that's an important concept because I think one of the 
you know, one of the crazy comments or perhaps crazier comments I've heard is that we're not really looking at patients with Alzheimer's disease. Well, not only is that statement an insult and, you know, disrespectful to these patients, right. but it's, it's patently false. Uh, the patients we've worked with uh, have, were previously diagnosed with um, MCI or dementia or something prior to, to coming into our studies. Um, anyway, yep. 64 patients uh, dosed them for 28 days, much like the phase 2A, and guess what? We saw very intriguing uh, biomarker effects. And again, for, uh, for me and for us, biomarkers don't lie. Right. They're there or they're not. And remember that biomarkers were all analyzed under blinded conditions. In other words, the uh, the CUNY lab and the other lab, uh, everyone receives a, a 96 well plate in which are um, uh, day zero samples or day 28 samples or controlled samples or, you know, basically there's no way to tell. This, the samples all look the same. They all smell the same. There's, no, there's nothing to distinguish the samples. And the scientists analyze the, uh, each sample. Uh, not knowing what they're actually analyzing, right. and, and they come up with placebo results. Or not. Yep. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, or placebo, or drug, or, or dose. So, um, so we analyzed the um, uh, the CSF um, analytes, and sure enough, we saw very intriguing uh, CSF uh, movements, something that had never been seen before in in Alzheimer's disease. There are drugs that can, or I should say, may move one or two biomarkers at once, but to my knowledge, no drug for no drug candidate for Alzheimer's disease has ever moved an entire panel of uh, biomarkers. Right. And that's what gets us excited. Um, from there, we uh, talked to the FDA about doing a large scale efficacy pro safety and efficacy program. And it was kind of a fork in the road. We could have done a large phase two or for a few more patients and a few more dollars, we could have run the same study uh, as a phase three. So we decided to run a phase three, but before running the phase three, we also decided to do an open label study of semiflam in, um, in patients with Alzheimer's disease. In this open label study, we had pre-plan analyses at six months, nine months, and 12 months. And these are pre-plan analyses on the first 50 patients to receive drugs at each time point, okay? Mm -hmm. and, um, and we also had biomarkers on, on 25 patients. And sure enough, biomarkers showed remarkable, uh, we think remarkable uh, effects after three months of dosing. Um, but what's very intriguing is an actual improvement on ATIS COG 11, an act, um, ATIS, yeah, ATIS COG 11, um, both at six, nine, and 12 months. I wanna say that I'm, I would be very, I would be ecstatic to just maintain oh, yeah. ATIS COG scores. But here we actually saw an improvement uh, will the improvement hold over tw over a full year and 200 patients? I certainly hope so. But again, I would be happy with just maintaining. Of course. Because by maintaining ADS COG 11, what you're really saying is you're providing, you're kind of giving these patients another year or two of quality of life. And, and really, that's what they want. Um now, you know, I also have to add all the caveats. It's an open label safety study. So first and foremost, we're uh, looking for signs of uh, safety signals. And as far as we can tell, there are no safety signals. It's an eminently safe uh, drug to date. Yep. Um, the cognition scores are, all I can say is the treatment effects are very intriguing. Um, we are not the first company to do an open label study in this type of uh, Alzheimer's patients. And to my knowledge, no other open label study has shown uh, treatment effects like we've shown. I haven't seen one either, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I just don't, if it's out there, I, I don't know about it. Yeah. 
Um, so, you know, I'll, you might ask, well, why why do an open label study in front of a phase three? Why not do what everyone else does, which is a phase three study, and then you do your open label study? Well, a couple reasons. Number one, you have to remember that the uh, that Alzheimer's R and D has a terrible, horrible record. It's basically been 30 years of failure, yeah. and I, I mean that 30 years where every <laughs> single freaking phase three study has failed. That's that's a mind-boggling record. We cannot give up. We shouldn't give up. Uh, on the other hand, y- you know, y- you hope that that industry and companies and, and investigators learn from 30 years of e- of effort, failed effort. So what we've learned is if a drug has no treatment effects in an open label study there's just no way i just cannot conceive of a way that 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 such a drug would work under more you know controlled right. environment so right so a, a good safeguard to make sure you're not spending 100 million dollars on something that wouldn't work or whatever the phase 3s will cost so you ran that exactly. study first mhm yeah great yeah Great. Now, the opposite, of course, is not true. Just because you see something interesting on Ada's cog in an open label doesn't mean, and it has really zero predictive value of what it might, what you might see in a phase three. Um, on the other hand, I, I strongly believe what I said earlier, which is if you see nothing in an open label, in a well, you know, a very a large, um, well-designed open label study, if there's nothing there, you ain't got a chance in right. your phase three. Right, right, great. So uh, I believe the FDA agrees with the uh, with what I just said to the extent that they did give us a special protocol assessment for the our phase three study, our phase three program. I'm sorry. So what is the what special is, protocol assessment? Ah, you beat me. I was just about <laughs> to say. Um, so special protocol assessment is a it's it's less than a contract but more than a handshake from FDA to a company that basically says we all agree on the key features of a phase 3 program okay so number of patients uh, type of patients, dosing period, um, most importantly the clinical end, endpoints um, it's basically a way of, of saying we, you know, we've all sat down, we've all discussed and agreed on, all, on, on the key design features of um, the phase three program. Great. Um, that's where we are. And as you as I've, I've you're heard, aware, we. I've heard of other companies having run their phase three program without special protocol assessment. And in, in the end, it was like this study was not designed very well. You ran this whole study and it wasn't designed very well. So that's an excellent thing that you guys that you meet with them first to talk about the design of the studies. So that, that is, that's very valuable. Yeah, and remember what I said: thirty-year history of failure in Alzheimer's disease R and D. We cannot give up. We should not give up. On the other hand, we need to learn. The industry needs to learn from thirty years of failure. Yep. Um, that's our takeaway. And for us, doing an open-label study in front of a phase three is. A point of learning. Yep, makes uh, sense. Getting two SPAs is a point of learning. Excellent. Uh, and you, you had you had uh, brought this up, but in one of your uh, press releases, you had mentioned some of the safeguards that were in place. You had mentioned some of these things, and, and I do want to talk about the phase threes because now you've launched these very important critical phase three studies. But just if we can spend a, another second on the twelve month open labels, you had talked about some of the, the safeguards in place. But can would, do you mind being a little bit more, uh, giving us a little more color on the safeguards in place, like electronic data capture, the chain of custody and the number of independent parties involved that go that do in fact ensure the integrity of the 12 month open label data uh, that has been, it's, it's been called into question when it really should not have been. I, I agree with, uh, with what you just said. It should not have been, but you know, it's there. Uh, there is this a small, but very vocal group of, I guess you'd have to call them haters 
uh, <laughs> who basically question everything we do. I mean, and I mean everything. Everything. Normally, um, you know, the chain of custody, uh, the electronic capture, I, and this is bread and butter stuff for any um, for any biotech company. But because there is so much noise, there's there are so many allegations. You know, outlandish. Outlandish. outlandish I've had two uh, separate stuff. people tell me, did you know that Sumifilam is pure LSD? Two to two separate occasions. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> the interview's over then, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I've heard some of the crazy stuff as well. And, you, you know, you just shake your hand because at the end of the day, uh, you know, all humor aside, we are attempting to we're 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 aiming high we're attempting to uh provide a drug treatment for uh patients who have alzheimer's disease um probably one of the worst uh, maybe not the worst but certainly up uh, you know in top 5 worst diseases that can afflict a a person especially at end of life you know you yeah. go through life all the ups and downs you've arrived at some at a certain age and then boom your memory is robbed Right. It's, it's, the, it's uh, one of the it, only it's diseases not a pretty sight. you can't say goodbye in yeah. the proper way. Right. Yeah, you can't even say hello, let alone well, goodbye. That's true too. So anyway, to your point, um, you know, we, we just sat down and said, you know what, let's be crystal clear, even though this is bread and butter stuff, let's be crystal clear about how investigator sites collect data from study subjects how the sites enter the clinical data directly into a computer system. The computer system is managed by an outside vendor. The vendor maintains the database. And at our request, the vendor transmits the data directly to uh, independent statisticians. The statisticians do their thing. They report the news to us. We sit down, format it into a press release, there we go. Um, again, it, this, like I, I call it bread and butter, but just to, to address some of, or, or perhaps to curtail additional uh, craziness, we just thought it might make sense to, to speak about the chain of custody. Good thinking, I think, yeah. Great, and so the, so importantly now, you've, you've begun not just one, uh, phase, not just one phase three with the SPA, but you've begun both phase three programs with the spo special protocol assessment, huge, important, probably, and maybe even very historic programs. How is it going with those two programs? It's going well. We are focusing on uh, getting as many clinical sites uh, as quickly as we can. Um, and then we'll focus on on getting as many patients into those sites as we can. Uh, a little bit of headwinds around COVID, yeah. uh, meaning that a lot of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of hospitals, a lot of uh, physician sites, uh, sort of lost their personnel during the what year and a half, two years of COVID. Yeah. Um, so some you know some sites have told us, look, we're interested, but we need to hire this person or that person. Um, that's probably an industry-wide observation. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, you know, sure. it's a sciences observ observation. But uh, but we have a good number of, of sites up and running. Uh, we have a, a great CRO called Premier, mm -hmm. Premier Research. They have done many, many neuroscience um, um, clinical studies. No, that's a clinical large... research organization. I'm not sure everybody knows that. Oh, good point. I, I take this stuff for granted. So Premier Research is a what's called a clinical research or a CRO, clinical research organization. And they essentially uh, supplement the internal team at Cassava Sciences to go out and find sites, uh, find patients, uh, find the right vendors, connect all these vendors together, uh, maintain that sense of independence between the clinical sites and the company. Um, uh, it's what they do. They charge an arm and a leg, um, <laughs> but we think we picked the right one. Yep. Great. Okay, super. And then not only are you, are you doing this uh, sort of under the auspices of the special protocol assessment from the FDA, you're also doing this with funding from the government as well. 
uh, the National Institute on Aging, a division of the National Institute of Health, uh, has given you repeated funding starting, I think, in 2017. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So um, one of the, uh, I suppose, the better programs, better government programs around is the NIH. Uh, the NIH is focused on very much so, or at least certainly the part of the NIH we're talking to is focused on innovations. Uh, things that perhaps, you know, Wall Street or private investors would never want to touch because it's new, it's different, it's innovative. Uh, NIH is not afraid to roll up its, its sleeves and um, take a chance. Good. That said, it is a highly, highly competi competitive program. Uh, someone once told me that uh, for N every NIH grant that is, or every uh, grant that is actually um, uh, provided to a company, there are something like 100 applicants. I, you know, is the math correct? I don't know, but um, that's what I was told. So wow. it, it's not a shotgun approach. It's more of a very, very meticulous uh, process that goes through peer review. And, you know, outside uh, independent scientists have to actually look at the data, look at the thesis, make sure there's something there so that they're not funding, you know, crazy stuff like, you know, as you put it, LSD or whatever. <laughs> um so yes, we, we've been very successful based on peer review um, on getting uh, NIH involved with our innovation. Great. And then uh, as a, your, your company is relatively small, you guys are growing. Uh, you, you, you're, you're sort of growing, I guess, in leaps and bounds a little bit these days, uh, but you're still a small company and AD, especially relative to the problem of AD, Alzheimer's disease is one of the biggest diseases in the world. Uh, will cassava be able to meet the need? Will cassava be able to manufacture drug for such a large population? Fair question. Um, we are small by design. I've I've worked with big companies. I've worked with small companies. Uh, I've grown small companies into mega companies and and the reverse. And I can tell you that uh, small companies work best. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, you know, there, there's more of a, a motivation factor, there's less bureaucracy, there's more ability to get stuff done, as opposed to just sit in meetings all day. Um, so we actually pride ourselves on being able to uh, potentially make a huge difference in clinical medicine on a relatively small in-house team. Yeah. That said, we obviously leverage the in-house team with for example, our CRO with outside manufacturing vendors and so forth. Your question, can we make the drug ourselves to satisfy the market? Oh, um, good question. <laughs> I don't know market. yet. I yeah. don't know yet. Yeah. It's a massive market. Yeah. Um, to some extent, uh, I don't worry about that as much because we have a small molecule which is relatively easy to synthesize as certainly as compared to making a, say, a monoclonal antibody. Right. Yeah, biologic. Um, and there are, you know, there are plants out there um, that, can, that can be ramped up, I think, relatively quickly. Um, we're also working with one of the largest uh, drug companies or chemical companies in the world called Evonik headquartered in, in, I think, Germany, but they have offices all over the world. Uh, Evonik makes the actual semiflin, the active ingredient, and then we use uh, other contractors to turn the semiflin powder into actual pills. Ah. But it, it's a fair question. I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer, not okay. yet. Okay, great. I, I appreciate the, uh, the honesty, the candor. Okay, so uh, let's let's uh, get have some fun here. Let's fast forward five or ten years. What does cassava sciences look like? You mentioned in a local Austin interview that you want to turn Austin into a hub for the biotech industry. In fact, you purchased a new campus with two buildings. Can you tell us about your long range plans and dreams for the company, or maybe even some additional things that can be done be done with your technology? So based on what we know of the science and the consistency of data, which is very important because remember, uh, 30 years of failure in Alzheimer's R&D, uh, based on the consistency of data 
and the strength of the science, we are absolutely 100% planning for success. Awesome. Uh, and Cap, this little throw in here. So, I mean, you've got Elon Musk down there. You think you can get him on the board or you think, uh, think he'll probably want to be on the board, I assume. One can only assume. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, something tells me you put Remy and Elon Musk in a room and, you know, <laughs> we'll be at each other's throats. Um, I have a lot of respect for the man, but he and I probably think alike on many different levels. Think big, yeah. uh, shoot for the stars, hire the best people you can, get involved in everything. Uh, don't be afraid of naysayers, you know, haters yeah. will hate, that type of thing. Yeah. He's been through it. He, in some, you know, in some regards, I, I have a lot of respect for the man because he, I mean, for a lot of reasons, but um, he, he's been through everything because Sava Sciences is, 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 is going through right now. Yes. And he showed them. Yeah. He showed them. Just and simply having a new technology is enough to have the haters hate. And he should be right. He showed yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine the idea of building a new car? When General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler were were you know basically the world leaders, yeah, I mean it was folly, right? It was absolutely folly. Uh, likewise, you know, a lot of our haters say it's folly to think that 25 people in the middle of Austin are going to come up with a uh, you know novel treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Well, yeah, it's all crazy. It's all folly until it becomes inevitable, and its science uh, shows that the, the drug works. That's right. So long way of saying we are absolutely uh, planning for success. We think we have the goods. Uh, obviously, uh, the drug still needs to go through a large safety and efficacy phase three program, which we are doing. Um, and uh, we'll see. Yep. Great. I got two quick ones, two quick fun ones here. What's it like being married to an incredible scientist, future Nobel Prize winner <laughs> and former Olympic athlete like Lindsay, like Dr. Burns? Uh, loving the question. And you know what? Uh, I, I rarely say no comments, but I'm going to say no comments. Okay. I'm going to pop out of smartest, that. One. Of all the smart things you said, that, you know, that's for the married men out there. Take note. <laughs> put, put, put it this way. It's not a bad thing. Yes. How's that? Not a, excellent. Thank you. Brilliant. And then uh, on behalf of the, well, from the, from the community here. So you, you, you have a, uh, your company, you and your company, you have a, an enthusiastic following. Uh, so that the vibrant savage, savage community uh, supporting, supporting you guys, we want to support however we can. How else, what else can we do? How can we help you succeed? Well, first of all, I really uh, truly have a deep appreciation for all those who are actually following the data and uh, investing with their their brains instead of their you know their emotions um it, it's we're a science shop and i get it that science is hard we we try hard to kind of translate complex science into things that into terms and and press releases that almost everyone should be able to read um sometimes we get it sometimes we miss the mark but uh, all this to say that uh, it can be a lonely fight, swimming against the tide. Uh, so very, very much support, uh, just appreciate the, uh, the, the whole community. And, you know, at the end of the day, some things go beyond money. Yes. Alzheimer's disease, I mean, obviously investors, you know, need to make a return. I get that. We get that. Um, but some things do go beyond money. Alzheimer's disease has potential to affect all of us. I don't think there's anyone who's not aware of someone, some, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, someone, so a coworker, who is untouched by Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so the the ability, you know, that that one chance that, you know, maybe we really do have something. Maybe the drug really does work. Maybe what we're seeing in the open label study has is for real. Yeah. You know, let's let's give the drug a chance. That's all we're saying. Give yeah. the drug a chance. Yeah. If it works, it's a great victory for humanity. If it doesn't work, okay, we've lost our time. Investors have lost one time their money. Um, but if it works, investors can make multiple times their money. Yes, 
Oh yes, yes. If this works, this is there's no bigger market, and uh, you, you guys are a small fraction of Biogen, which is just a failure. And there and there's still so much. There's still and there there there's you can go up to the level of Pfizer. You guys have so much room for growth. If you, and so with uh, and you seem to be set up so well. So it looks like it looks like your runway is very long. And you're doing yeah, I mean, don't get me started on Biogen, but you know, <laughs> at some level, it's disgraceful charging whatever it is, sixty, fifty, sixty thousand yeah. dollars. I saw someone just died. No... One of their patients just died from an edema. Yeah, so, and you know, the drug does have some known um, adverse uh, adverse effects, brain inflammation, et cetera. I mean, it's. I, I, I'm not sure how some of those people sleep at night. I agree. Um, I agree. But it's 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 not my company, not my story. Uh, put it this way: I would never have gone to the FDA for approval um, with that that type of data. Yep, I agree. Well, Mr. Barbier, you've been so generous uh, and gracious with your time. I appreciate it so much. And on behalf of really the world community, you guys are, are fighting the good fight. And then just the loudest people are the haters. And there's just no earthly reasonable reason. There's no reason you guys should be having any negativity come your way. So thank you guys so much on behalf of everyone and everyone's families uh, for trying to cure this awful disease. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Take care now. Take care. Thank you. How about that? That was awesome. Thank you guys uh, for uh, for tuning in. I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, maybe we'll do another uh, show to talk about it, uh, but I'm going to wrap it up now and say thank you very much.